Hey, everybody, welcome back to today's show. Interesting times we're dealing with out there, right? Well, I brought on an interesting friend of mine, Mr. Eddie Speed. He's going to join us today. Eddie has been a note guy, but he's really known as kind of a creative deal structuring guy, kind of a deal architect. And that is the economy that we're about to lead into. The truth is, I actually went to one of Eddie's trainings here just a few months back, kind of preparing for the next down market, not knowing that just a few months later, we would be here and certainly not knowing uh, the way that we would get it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're actually going to look back at the history of the last four or five downturns in the market, what Eddie learned and learned from it to teach you how to move ahead. That's how we move ahead is we rely on wisdom from people that have been through that experience before to move forward. Lots of opportunity out there for us. Today, we're going to learn the roadmap how. Welcome to Real Estate Investing Secrets. We're all looking for freedom and the opportunity to live better, more fulfilling lives. But most of us were trained our entire lives to work for someone else and chase their dreams. How can we use real estate investing as a vehicle to achieve financial freedom? My life is dedicated to answering your real estate investing questions and helping you build an investing business that allows you to change your life and the world around you and to enable you to turn your dreams of financial freedom into a reality. My name is Mike Hambright from FlipNerd.com, and your questions get answered here on the Real Estate Investing Secrets Show. Hey, Eddie, welcome to the show. How are you, Mike? Good, good. Good to see you, buddy. It's, it's funny. We always joke about this. I see you more on podcasts and other things. We're actually in the same market for the most we part. Are. And, uh, you know, don't, don't see you often enough in person, but good to see you, my friend. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we can't see each other right now, right? That's right. Yeah, for maybe the first time in history, we, we technically should not be seeing each other in person. So yeah. um, it's an interesting market, right? You, you've been doing these workshops for a while now. I mean, you've obviously been a note guy for a long time. And I know that you kind of put two and two together maybe a year, a year and a half ago and said, hey, you know what? You know, the note side, I mean, maybe you could maybe you could explain it better than me. You kind of knew the note side, but you're like, how do you, how do you convert or how do you teach a single family investor how to understand note architecture, because that's really what we're gonna be talking about today here is how to do deals creatively, right? How to structure them that aren't just cash transactions. Well, you know, the, the, the modern day real estate investor, what I call the ninja real estate investor, right? You've heard me refer to that. The guys that buy 50 or 100 or 300 houses a year, they're great marketers. They're the best marketers the industry's ever seen. And they're actually great psychologists at the co closing table. You know, they all, they've all followed these lineages that of the great marketing strategies and the great, you know, the, the John Martinez of how to close them at the table and all that stuff. And so they really, really got good at that. And I, you know, been around the space a very long time, but I think this modern day real estate investor is, you know, excessively better than in the past. Yeah. But that's how evolution works, right? We get better, yeah. we get better. And then, you know, when you go through a down market, you got to pull back in your bag of tricks and say, let me, let me pull out that playbook that, that worked back then. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. A couple of years ago, I'm in these masterminds and, and uh, you know, listen to all these guys and they're kind of crying the blues because their conversions are dropping, right? The number of offers they make and closings was going down and their margins were slipping, you know? And so, you know, they're, they're, they're flipping houses, they're wholesaling houses to either a hedge fund for the most part, a hedge fund or an HGTV buyer, right? Well, in other words, let's be let's be fair about it. The guy in the middle, in the old days of flipping houses or, or wholesaling contracts, was the least experienced, and he was wholesaling a house to a guy like you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now that changed, and the most seasoned guy is the middle, and they're flipping the contract off to an amateur, right? An amateur mm -hmm. house buyer, which yeah. is an HGTV lover. And uh, anyway, in the middle of that, they're kind of talking about their margins are shrinking and shrinking and stuff. And so I said, well, just go buy on terms. They're like, what? I'm like, you know, just structure these crazy terms, you know, and really give them the price they want, but you're not really paying them today. You're paying them tomorrow. And the way you structure the terms, you could kind of overpay and make it a bargain of the way you paid them back. Right. Right. And you've been to, you've seen all this. Yeah voodoo stuff I do on the whiteboard and stuff. Yeah. And you say voodoo, it's, it's good stuff. The truth is, is like, you know, it's just a more sophisticated way to buy. It's like, if you can buy on terms, we're going to talk about some different levers you can pull yeah. um, and structure the deal differently. You can, the truth is, is you can turn deals that you were 
passing on in the past into actual deals, sometimes more profitable than, than if you had paid cash for it, right? depending on what you do with it. Correct. So I just did it. I just did that as a gap, seeing these guys having to overpay for houses and figuring out a way how they could essentially overpay, but make it a bargain, yeah. right? Because they're paying the equity tomorrow and there's all kind of different ways to negotiate interest and when you start interest and in all of that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Well, in that process, I had a lot of those really seasoned guys say, boy, I'll bet you in the next market, that's going to be unbelievable. I said, of course it will. Yeah, right. Yeah. I learned all this stuff in the stress markets. Right. I didn't learn any of this stuff in great markets. It was always when something went wrong that it forced me to go figure out something new. That's how we all learn. I've been talking, you know, I've been doing this silver lining series three times a week here. By the way, if anybody hasn't registered for that, it's flipner.com slash America. We're doing these live 90 minute segments. I'm bringing in kind of like a new show. Every 20 minutes, I have a new expert coming in and we're talking about stuff. And I've said that several times, like what makes somebody an expert? Well, it's like, well, they've been punched in the face a lot and shot in the back with a few arrows, right? That's, that's really how you learn is by learning what not to do or how to pivot when something does happen, right? Yeah, it's true. Yep. Yep. So anyway, you know, I learned buying on terms. Originally, I think I bought my first house on terms in like 1983. My wife, Martha, and I were young and moved to Dallas Fort Worth to be entrepreneurs in the <laughs> note creative finance business and stuff. And, you know, interest rates were 14%. And we were self-employed. Wouldn't be bankable if on a bet, no matter what interest rates were. Yep. So for all the reasons, there's no way we could buy a house except we just came up with terms that we would pay for a house and the interest rate and how we paid them back. And that was probably our first seller finance experience. And that was because there was no other way to make it work. We were in, in, in the desire to do something and buy a property. The only way we could do it was get the seller to work with us. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go back because you, you just you just aged yourself there. I, I try to stay away from comments that age myself. You know you know better than that, Eddie. But you basically just said, hey, you started doing deals on terms roughly 37 years ago, I think is what I just calculated there. Um, I did that without a calculator, my friend. So we're going to kind of go through what you learned in the early 80s, you know, 86 when the market crashed, 86, 87, like all these different time frames and what you learned along the way. And I definitely want people to listen up because um, there's some great learnings here, right? You, Eddie said something before we started recording that, now is when the time when you want to learn from people that have gray hair. And uh, I've got a bunch of gray hair coming on here, if you haven't noticed. So i got some wisdom myself. Before we jump into this, guys, I don't I kind of normally wait till the end to share any links for anything. But Eddie's offered a book. He actually just finished this book, Buying on Terms, and the electronic version, an ebook that you can get for free. So if you go to flipner.com slash buying on terms, B-U-Y-I-N-G, on terms, uh, we'll get you a copy of that. So make sure flipner.com slash buying on terms. We're going to kind of jump into it here, but for those of you that, that uh, might bail out at some point, I want to make sure that you get some value there. So go ahead. So let's talk about the early 80s, kind of when you started, some of the lessons that you learned at that point that are very much as applicable today as they were back then. So um, I meet my yeah, wife's, she, she was my girlfriend then. I meet her dad who got me in the business. You know the story. Yep. 1980, I was a kid, I was 20 years old, right? And uh, here's the first thing I would say to you is I entered the business and we were buying seller finance notes, which was just the Oklahoma land rush, right? And I mean, we were killing it. Yeah. And every realtor that had been in the business for 20 years or banker or mortgage guy or home builder in 1980 was going broke. Interest rates were 20%. And I'm like, oh my God, it's the best thing I can ever imagine. So the first thing I would say to you as a very young age in this business is attitude is everything. Because I had a great attitude. I didn't know any, I was too dumb to know any different. And, and the truth be told, you know, these other guys, you know, they were kind of scarred up and it, it stopped them from finding the next opportunity. Right? Yeah. Okay. We're so seeing that right now, right? Is the people are, the times get, times get tough. And they just moved to the sideline when, you know, I kind of use this uh, analogy here a minute ago of like, that's when you go to the library and you're like, okay, let me pull out the playbook. Let me pull out the, the uh, downward market playbook. Right. And that's, this is, this is what you do as a mature real estate investor is you have different levers, different tools you use in different markets. Right. 
it's and, and once again it's it's attitude is everything or or you know listen we're not this is stressful right anybody that said it didn't is you know they're just lying or they're a fool one of the two <laughs> but you know also i was just telling you before we start taping i mean these 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 government programs are pretty amazing i mean like if you're not like if you don't really know what you're eligible for you're you're not paying attention because yeah. i mean there's some cool stuff and I've got an executive team that's been working deeply at, at implementing those processes. All right, so I enter the market. Real estate is dying because interest rates are 20%, Mike, 20%. And uh, seller financing becomes a thing. Okay. Now, what I thought was by 1985 when the interest rates dropped to like 10%, which sound ridiculous today, but that was a true statement. I thought that nobody would ever seller finance again. What we learned in that cycle is that people found uses for seller financing that they've now continued with 40 years later. So mm -hmm. we, we learned things that otherwise we didn't know. But two, two things I learned in that cycle, first of all, was attitude and I saw mature business people that that could not understand why I was so happy and that's because I was going down a lane that was working and they were going down a lane that was failing hmm. right and yep. then the second thing is is seller financing became a necessity and and it was buying on terms Mike in 1980 yep right okay well I moved to Dallas Fort Worth and uh you know I'm a country boy from Mississippi right and drive up here and big high rise buildings and Martha and I are living in North Dallas and oh my goodness. And all of a sudden there's like 60 of those, you know, wolf cranes, they call them those gigantic cranes that build the glass buildings. And then around 1986, there was like zero. Yeah. And the most profitable uh, company in town was the company that sent, changed the names out in front of the signs of the banks, mm. of the sign company. So uh, yeah. anyway, it's just crazy times. And we, and that's where we learned about non-performing notes. A little uh, DFW joke when you talk about North Dallas there. At back then, North Dallas was Northwest Highway, right? <laughs> now it's about 20 miles north of there, but yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. you know, I learned about non-performing notes in that era. And then we would buy these defaulted mm -hmm. notes and then use seller finance strategies to resell the properties. Banks weren't making loans. Right. And so we came in like we were just the smartest cats you've ever seen. And trust me, I, I know myself, I don't think I'm smart, <laughs> but we just had been so ingrained in understanding how this could work. And, and so we really, bam, I mean, here we were, you know, using creative financing, you know, we were buying defaulted loans and we would foreclose or get a deed or just modify the customer and let them pay again. Right. Right. Same thing I was doing a few years ago in 2008. So, a lot of these things kind of came back. Now they're all, they're never quite the same, but I certainly, that changed my perspective of the market. And I would say that we saw seller financing grow exponentially in Texas. So Texas is the biggest seller finance state in the United States. And I believe it's a hundred percent result of the RTC days. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Because people just learned that they didn't have to depend on the banks. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway, the market goes along and I set up the note system for, for my old friend, Ken, that, that founded Homevestors and all that in the early 90s. And we really kind of set a formula to the business, right? No, real estate investors didn't really have a recipe or a formula of how to create seller financing. So that's what we did. We set a real standard to the business. And by the way, the biggest buyer of seller finance notes in 1992 or three would have been the associates. Right. And they were buying about $75 million worth of loans a year. I launched the Homevestor system. And of course, there was a, you know, 300 other real estate investors that weren't Homevestor franchises that copied it. And all of a sudden, you look at associates three years later and they're buying $250 million in seller finance notes a year. Yeah. So real estate investors had adjusted to buying based on, right? You know, typically what real estate investors do or have been doing is they're buying at a certain percentage of the after repaired value. They know what they can sell it to a, a landlord or a hedge fund or, or a rehabber for. 
Yeah. And back then it was buying it on terms that they knew were um, standardized enough to where it wasn't a complicated. I mean, I know that was part of the process too, was getting, getting the terms uh, set so that a, so somebody would want to buy it. But effectively they knew what the note buyers would pay for it. And they were, they would lock it up and then just basically trade that to associates. Right. We, we they would sell or finance a property, but they would sell or finance to an underwriting matrix which yeah. nobody had ever really done before. Right. So we taught the private lender how to underwrite to a lending box, right? Certain ratios, depending on the credit and other variables and stuff. And then all of a sudden, then, then they knew they could sell it. And we were real successful at that. Sure. So by 1995 or six, um, alt a lending came to the business, right? They didn't even call it alt a lending back then, but it was like, like hedge funds and insurance companies said, Hey, we don't have to do Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. We'll do somebody just, uh, just miss customer. Right. And so then they so meaning started, kind of distress notes, but not that bad. Exactly. Like they're not, if you kind of like look at distress notes, they're like, like you said, they missed a payment or they're, they're never paying. Like there's this spectrum of how, how, how stinky is that produce? Right. That actually was pretty decent product. The stuff they were doing in 2006 was nuts. Yeah. Right. But, and so they were, so we're packaging these loans and selling them on wall street mortgage backed securities. Right. Right. And so that market really built up by 2008, the mortgage backed securities market. This was the first time it had really grown to be such a, a giant piece of the market. It blew up. Yeah. So by, by 1998, real estate investors were like buying houses, you know, rehabbing them, selling them to a consumer, and they were getting one of these less than perfect loans. And they were, that loan was getting sold on Wall Street. And boy, it was a machine and it was really rolling. And all of a sudden, boom, it died. Yeah. And so the guys that survived went back to seller financing. Right. The old guys that, you know, you and I know, well, even around Dallas Fort Worth, every one of them, if you want to know why they were, they were, they, they could adapt and went back to seller financing. Right. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you know, the mortgage business gets back, the wheels back underneath it. And by probably 2001 or two, the mortgage backed securities thing, and it just got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. Right. So the market blew up in, in 1998, People went back to creative financing. Then all of a sudden the mortgage market came back. Every time creative financing filled the gap, conventional lending didn't fill. Yeah. Right. Oh, by the way, all the hard money lenders went broke in 2000, 1998. Okay. Everybody I know that was hard money lending virtually went broke in 1998. Yeah. Okay. And as of right now, I mean, a good number of them right now, or just so many uncertainties are, they're, they're uh, radio silent right now. They're, they're on, are they just levered their fees way up to say, well, we'll lend to you if you're willing to pay $4,000 initiation or origination or whatever. So. Yeah. I want to, I want to be careful. I know some crazy smart, good lenders that are hard money lenders. So I'm yep. not fixing to go playing a black, you know, mark over the, every one of them. No, but what happens is over time, whether it's the federal government, FHA type loans, or, um, or hard money loans, like people just get sloppy over time, right? They're doing some stuff they probably shouldn't do, but you start to get to this point where you're like, I can't really lose, or the risk of me losing is so small that let's just kind of uh, be willing to do some loans that we maybe weren't willing to do in the past. I mean, it's this site, that's why there's a cycle, right? As we get sloppy, we make bad decisions, and uh, then stuff pops. Pro proven fact, hard money lending, as the market gets hotter, they lend and lend more money and they lower their rates. At lower rates, right. And then that property, if it takes more than about 145 days to cycle, the fees on that loan start making it where it will never mathematically work out, right? And so if you go back in history and look at the hard money lending space, and you and I had a conversation about this the other day, that's the pattern. Yeah. So then we got to the roaring 2000s, okay? And everything, everybody is running with money in both hands. This sound familiar? Can't make a mistake. If we don't buy now, we'll never be able to afford it. 
when they when they say that you need to run for the hills <laughs> right and so and to the degree that you know we've never seen real estate so pricey and we've never seen lending so loose right and of course the the 2008 debacle happened and um and then all of a sudden the note space, creative financing, buying non-performing notes, owner financing, you know, structuring deals with private money to finance your deals and stuff. It wasn't just a good idea. It was impossible for you to survive if you could not do that. Absolutely possible. And let me just say something. I make it sound like I may have figured it out every step of the way, but let me tell you something. I got clobbered a lot. I mean, like I, I tried to fix some major things every time the next cycle happened because, and one thing that always killed me, and that's because why I've done all these tens of thousands of note deals is I was selling loans to institutional investors, right? right? That's why I could do such a volume. Well, I swore after 2008, I was never going to be reliant on institutional money because it had been so traumatic for me in the past when that wasn't available. Yeah. So I became highly focused from 2008 until today with for private money, right? And I believe that's going to be good for me because private money is going to be desperately looking for an investment. No doubt. And and so it's a matter of structuring a really safe deal that they can feel comfortable with. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, we're early in this thing, you know, uh, you know, you, you, I, I told my son-in-law, my son, my daughter in, is a professional ballet dancer. And so they, they, they live in Denver and he works for us. And so they got shut down in downtown Denver well, a couple of weeks ago, they came down here. And so he'll tell he works with us. So, you know, he and I spend a lot of time together and stuff. And I said, well, let me tell you something. I'm not going to watch Nightline anymore. I can tell you right now. I'm done watching Nightline after last, it, it, it was, because they just scared the crap out of you. <laughs> right. it's gonna, the, the unemployment's going to be twice as bad as the Great Recession or Depression. So here's what I know. We are going to have an impact in the market. I think that the way you structure the financing around your real estate deal is going to be super critical to your success or failure, because up until now, you just had to put a house under contract. And I'm not saying that's easy, but you had to put a house under contract and go find somebody that was enamored with real estate because they like TV, right? And, and go flip that contract to them and you made a good margin in the middle. Buy low, sell high, right? But, yeah. but I don't believe the HGTV buyer is gonna be quite so enamored with buying real estate and uh, so there's a lot of things about the market. And, and I'm, I think you and I are, are on kindred spirits of this. We're not laughing or gloating. We're just saying the guy that's the, got the survival mentality is the guy that's going to gonna thrive. Yeah, you got, if nothing else, if you, you know, I'm not saying wholesaling is dead, but you got to be more principled. You can't pay 72, 75% for a house, try to sell it at 85%. Like that, that stuff's drying up because people that are paying 85% and then rehabbing it, are nuts. Like and that never made sense. But again, people get sloppy. So you got to go back to buying deep when you can get them. And I think largely what we're talking about here is if nothing else, having this be a tool in your tool belt, it's like if that cash offer doesn't work, um, then it's like, okay, well, how else can we structure the deal to uh, still make the seller happy enough to be able to do the deal and with adjusting terms, still make it a good deal for you. Right. So what, Eddie, we don't have a ton of time today, but maybe you could share a couple of quick like examples of, of things that, you know, come to mind with something that I know you could make these deals as complicated as you want to, but it also don't need to be that complicated, right? So maybe kind of share a couple of examples of deals that somebody can't do, they can't get deep enough, but here they could still make it work if they do, if the seller agrees to these terms, right? Well, one market condition that we know is going to exist more than it ever has is the burnout landlord factor, right? Yeah. They, there's so many, there's, what is it? There are 18 million residential doors more than there were 10 years ago. Mm. And obviously you don't have 18 million happy landlords. Most of them are amateurs. They have five units or less. And uh, there's going to be a huge opportunity to buy those properties 
and from them and resell them. But in, instead of buying them and paying cash, they wanted cash flow. So you can structure a deal and let them carry terms. You could take over the underlying mortgage. You can wrap it. You can, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing it. It doesn't have to be free and clear. It doesn't have to be leveraged up to the hilt. It can be somewhere. It can be on either end or somewhere in the middle. There's different ways you can structure it. Right. You, you and I have talked about those things a lot. Yeah. So I think that's one obvious thing is the, the burnout landlord factor is where the capital is going to come from to fund my note business. Right. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's going to be we were talking about this at the time we're recording this. Just for, just for uh, to to be straight with everybody, that's three thirty one. So rents are due tomorrow. By the time this comes out, we'll be a couple of days. We'll, we'll be about a week later. So it's going to be really interesting. I I own a portfolio. I'm an investor in a bunch of multifamily uh, with hundreds and hundreds of doors. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with rent collections here. But I think no doubt we've been talking about this a lot. The landlord. There's always been the the. Um, distressed landlord or the burned out landlord to go after. But yeah. I think there's a bunch of people that have bought turnkey or they bought them in a way over the past couple of years where rents kept going up. They were getting paid like clockwork or we're not, we're not having a lot of disruption. And now they're faced with, you know, potentially multiple months of lost rent on some. If, the thing is, is if, like you said, a lot of people have one, two, three doors, like a lot of people, they're not, not everybody's these big companies. It's a husband and wife that decided to start buying some real estate and they got a couple of deals under their belt. So when you have a portfolio, you can generally, you can weather these storms because they're all not going to not pay. But when you have two or three, like if one or two of them's not paying or God forbid all of them, you know, you feel that pain a lot, a lot more. Right. Yeah. So that's a, that, that's, that's going to be a gigantic thing for sure. And they'll carry the payments for you long-term you know, they just want out of the brain damage of being a landlord and right. they're not, you know, listen, let's be fair about it. They have five units or less. They're not really committed to the business like we are. And I'm not saying they should be. I'm sure they're great at what they do <laughs> every day, but this is, they're, they're finding out really quick that they're amateurs in a professional market. Yeah. So that's one like screamer to me that jumps out. And the other thing is, uh, and I want to be clear about this because I'm very, very, very good friends with a lot of really professional hard money lenders. But let me just tell you, if I if I miss this one, you can go back and mark this presentation and go, boy, Eddie, first of April, he missed this prediction completely. Hard money lending is going to become excessively different. Hmm. And when you do, this is when you're going to have to become a lot more skilled at structuring private money deals. Now, here's the good news. You're gonna find out you make more money, but it's, it's, you're gonna to have to be, you're gonna to have to become more skilled at figuring out how to structure acquisition money to buy a property. And that's a zillion different ways you can do it. Yeah. But here's an easy, just some easy math, Mike. Okay, just easy math. You, you get a private lender and he's going to loan you 50% of the cost of the property. Okay. So he, you do, he does a first mortgage property cost hundred. He loans you 50. Then you get the seller and he loans you the other 50. Now he gets 50,000 at the closing, right? Because that hard money lender funded 50,000. And then the lender says, I'm going to loan you half the money. You got to get, you got to, position it so that they're okay with this, but this can be fairly easily done. Mm -hmm. And then he loans it to you on soft terms, right? So he lends it to you at below market rates and deferred interest and maybe deferred payments and all kinds of different things that could be negotiated. And you wake up and figure out, then you can resell this property on a wrap note. And now you got a good down payment when you sell it. And then you get a cash flow for 20 years and you're like, man, this real estate debacle turned out to be great for me. <laughs> well, those are silver line. I mean, the truth is, is, and you know this, in every downturn, we all get punched in the face. And, but for those that run away, you know, there is no upside. For those that say, okay, what's the recipe for this? How do I do this? What tool do I use for this? Is there's always opportunity here as well. I mean, whenever, you know, there's certain industries that will be changed forever from, certain certain downturns there's always industries that get wiped out or people just like for example the movie theater industry that thing has been a ticking time bomb forever 
stuff like this is like the a nail in the coffin, right? It's like, I just want, I could watch these things at home in my media room or on Netflix or prime or whatever. Like that's just a matter of time. And truthfully, even in this downturn, they're putting new releases on prime. You can just, you can rent them for like 20 bucks because those movies that were at the theater they they went to zero, you know, unless you do something like that. So I think that industry is ripe for the changing at the end of the day, the real estate market changes all the time, but there's people and they need shelter and that's, that's never going to change, right? How the deals are structured is going to change and how things play out is going to change, but housing's not going away and people aren't going away. So there's still an opportunity for us here. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Our, my net worth changed more in the, in the, uh, downturn markets than it ever did in the upturn markets. So just, yeah. you know, I mean, once again, I'm, I'm like everybody else. I got lots of employees. I've got, you know, got people that are owing us money on a mortgage. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not Pollyanna and like, there's no disruption. Sure. But you know, if you're, if you're mentally prepared for the disruption and you've got a structure that can handle it, then you know, the sun's going to come out again and you kind of, I'm already, I'm already, deep into that play of what that may look like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For those of you guys that, that, that missed this up front, um, Eddie is a creative um, deal architect and he kind of teaches people how to monetize deals that you couldn't just pay cash for that. This doesn't work. So you could use terms to negotiate. I mean, if you think about this, the average homeowner, you know, these numbers better than me, Eddie, but if you go buy a hundred thousand dollar house, they get a hundred thousand dollar mortgage, let's say, over the course of 30 years, depending on interest rates, of course, but you know, you're paying not a hundred thousand, you're paying 250, $300,000 with all the interest in there. Right. That's so right. When you, and that's, and, and that, that is all revenue for somebody or multiple people. Right. And it's because it's on terms. It's what happens over time. So when banks lend to you, they mark that up, they're borrowing at a lower rate and they're, or they're selling that, they're selling that note off and they're, they're making money from, the, the loan part of it, the interest over time, the terms, right? That's what we're talking about here is how you can effectively become the bank uh, or the architect with maybe turning other people into banks and you're making, you're making deals happen in the middle. Yeah. And it, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You don't have to do it one way, but um, you know, creative financing is, is going to be a huge factor. And uh, I believe uh, a lot of people have had income disruption and uh, they're not going to fit a conventional uh, mortgage uh, underwriting box, but that doesn't mean they're bad people. And uh, so we'll figure out lots of innovative ways to do it. So yep. that's it. And there's always people. And, and why would people buy on terms instead of an FHA loan? Why would they pay higher rate? Well, maybe they're not credit worthy. Like Eddie said, some folks don't have any established credit. Like they just, they just never had credit card to get a credit score before. Right. They're not kind of credit worthy. And then the truth is, is there's always people that, you know, went from making a million dollars a year down to $500,000 a year and there's a bankruptcy there. So they still make a lot of money, but on paper, they look like they're, they're, they're not somebody that a traditional bank would lend to. Right. Or entrepreneurs, right. You generally, until you have two years tax returns, like you're not going to get a traditional loan. So there's a lot of reasons why people would use, alone the same it's the same reason why when i i'm a dallas stars uh season ticket holder of course season's uh on pause right now same reason i pay five dollars for a for a 20 cent bottle of water <laughs> is I, I have to that's my only option when i'm there right so um well guys uh eddie maybe any let me give out this link one more time flipner.com slash buying on terms that's where you can get a copy of eddie's ebook that's going to teach you some fundamentals about buying on uh, terms and how to structure some deals. Eddie, any kind of final words of wisdom for folks that are listening right now that haven't been through a downturn before and, you know, might be scared of it. Um, you and I both know there's a silver lining here, but any kind of words of uh, wisdom, my friend? It's attitude. It's, it's what I learned as a kid when I started this business 20, at 20 years old in 1980 is that the people that, that all he could see the black could never figure out how to reinvent themselves. Yeah. I came into the business not knowing any different. So I didn't have to reinvent myself because I didn't have, I wasn't, you know, marred down with those thoughts. And I just think, you know, we are going to have to reinvent ourselves and uh, attitudes, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's always asking the question and, you know, you hear about this type of stuff, not in the context we're in now is instead of saying this doesn't work or, you know, I can't make this work anymore. It's turn it around and say, how do I make this work? Right. There's always, there's always an asterisk next to what we do. There's always a way to make it work, especially with terms. Like you can pull some other levers that aren't just price, like cash only, right? 
it's yeah. you, you get uh, you get out some precision tools and you find a way to make it work. That's it. Awesome. Well, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Appreciate you. Everybody that's listening right now, there's some really good information in this book. Eddie's been around for a long time. I actually went to uh, a boot camp that he had here just a few months back and learned some great things. And I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, cause honestly, I and everybody else that was there in that workshop knew that we're really preparing for a down market. None of us knew just a few months later that it would be hitting. We all know it's coming. We're all honestly, most of us are a bit surprised it hadn't happened yet. Nobody knew the way it would come out that would kind of kickstart off here by a virus. But at the end of the day, uh, we're here. We don't know how long and how wide this thing's going to be. We'll find out, but this is a great tool for you to have in your tool belt at any time. So make sure you check out that link, flipner.com slash buying on terms. Connect with Eddie on Facebook. He shares a lot of great information out there on social media. If you haven't yet subscribed to our show yet, please do, whether you're on iTunes, YouTube, uh, of course, watching everything on flipner.com where we have over 1,500 shows that we've created over the past six and a half years. So appreciate you guys a ton. Stay safe, stay strong, and uh, might be time to get a little bit creative. See you on the next show. Thanks for listening to today's show. There are three ways I can help you start or grow your real estate investing business. If you're a new investor and just getting started, the Flip Nerd Investor Coaching Program is the most effective program in America. I've been coaching and mentoring new real estate investors for 10 years, and my students have literally purchased thousands and thousands of properties. Many of them started with little to no experience at all. Our program is a paint by numbers program where we tell you exactly what to do week by week to make sure that you don't get distracted on your way to results. We show you how to build a real business, not just create another job for yourself. New memberships are limited. You can learn more and apply or schedule a call with me and my team at flipnerd.com slash coaching. If you're an experienced investor doing a minimum of 10 deals a year, up to 500 deals a year or more, or have a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio already, you should check out our powerful Investor Fuel Real Estate Investor Mastermind. Over 100 of the nation's leading real estate investors are members, and it's not uncommon for our members to two to five X their business just from getting around other members at Investor Fuel. At Investor Fuel, each of us are business advisors to one another's businesses, but we don't stop at business. We focus heavily on becoming better people and living fuller lives. If you're looking for fuel for your business or fuel for your life, please check out Investor Fuel. Dot com. Applications and interviews are required as most investors are not a fit for our community. Please learn more at InvestorFuel.com. If you're not ready for coaching or masterminds, but eager to start learning more about investing, please join our private Facebook group by visiting FlipNerd.com Facebook. New members get access to free training from us right here at FlipNerd.com. And it's a community to safely ask your questions. A great place to get started. Simply go to flipnerd.com slash Facebook to request your access today.